Congressman, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Well, you're more than welcome, sir. One of the things that is really striking about you, especially, is, is that you were raised by parents, aunts and uncles, who said, don't be a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. But you're someone who made trouble. You were arrested 45 times, five times as a congressman. How does a man who was raised not to make trouble be such a profound influence, a change maker, and a troublemaker of the 20th century. What was it about you? I grew up in rural Alabama, as you well know, and I saw many problems and issues that I was not at home with. But as a young child, I would ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why this, why that? And my mother would always say, boy, don't get in trouble. As a young child, I wanted to be a minister, so I read the Bible, and I learned from the teaching of Jesus, and later from the teaching of Gandhi. After I heard of Martin Luther King Jr. and, and Rosa Parks, I went off to school to Nashville. We had a wonderful man by the name of Jim Lawson, who was a teacher. Mm not in college, but he was a teacher of the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. Taught us the way of peace, the way of love, taught us the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. And a few weeks and months later, I, I met Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, when I was 18. I met Rosa Parks when I was 17. Inspired me to get in trouble. What was it about nonviolence, about the philosophy of nonviolence that was so striking to you? The philosophy of nonviolence uh, became for me a way of life, a way of living, the way of love, to have the ability, the capacity, uh, uh, not to hate, but to just love everybody. On one occasion, I heard Dr. King say, in a sort of playful manner, he said, just love everybody, love the hell out of everybody. And it became part of me. When we started sitting in at the lunch counters, mm -hmm. going on the freedom rides, the marches, when we were being beaten, left bloody, going off to jail, the more and more that I got arrested and went to jail, the more I embraced the way of peace. Now, you, you've said that the first time you're arrested, that it set you free. Oh, yes. And most people would think that being arrested would have the other effect, not set one free, feel confined. What was it about being arrested to you that made you feel free? The first time I got arrested, I, I, I felt f free. I just felt free. I felt like I had crossed over to another way a better way, because people use the way of arresting people, of threatening people to be jailed, as a way to keep people from engaging or prevent people from engaging in, in a struggle. And we would say from time to time when we were being arrested or being jailed, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. When you were, I believe it was in Troy, which was a town not far from the farm you grew up, and the first time you went to Troy, or one of the first times you went to Troy, you saw the reality of segregation. When you saw these signs of blacks, whites only, what was your feeling? What was your, did you have an immediate vile feeling for this? Did you understand it? I understood very well. Um, the sign saying white waiting, colored waiting, white men, colored men, white women, colored women. It, uh, it just left a bad taste for me. And to go down to the little town of Troy and to a, a drugstore, you see a fountain, uh, and African-American young people, children, could not come to that fountain and get something to drink, to order a soda, or ice cream cone, or to go downtown to a movie. All of us little white children had to go upstairs to the, the balcony, and all of the little white children went downstairs, and I kept asking questions.
But hearing of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. when I was 15 years old mm. gave me this sense of determination that I could do something, that I could make a contribution. And then hearing the Little Rock, the Little Rock Nine, mm. and I got to know many of those young people that um, tried to desegregate uh, a Central High. And meeting Rosa Parks in 57 and Dr. King in 58, just set me on a path, and there was no turning back. What did the death of Emmett Till have? What impact did that have on you? You were 15 years old, I think. How, 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 much, how did that impact you when you heard about it? And well, about it? I, I remember so well in August 1955, when I heard about Emmett Till being lynched. Uh, it reminded me of my first cousins who lived in Buffalo, New York, and they would come home during the summer the same way that Emmett Till left Chicago and went to Mississippi to visit his relative. I said, the same thing can happen to these cousins of mine. And it made me more determined than ever before if I ever had a chance, I got the chance to do something, to say something, I would do it. And a few months later, there were Rosa Parks. And growing up only 50 miles from Montgomery, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me to do something, to try to do something. You know, I was really, it's remarkable, the first time that you John F. Kennedy was elected, and you sat down, I think it was the day after Kennedy was elected, you sat down at the counter while you were a student at Fisk in Nashville. And when the waitress refused to serve you, she poured disinfectant on you and a pitcher of water over your food. And the diner manager served, put a, sprayed you with an insect repellent. And every natural instinct of someone would be to strike back. How, how did you not? How did you incorporate nonviolence in that moment? Well, we were taught not to strike back. A, a group of students from Fizz, Vanderbilt University, Tennessee State, and American Baptist, we had studied, we had role playing, we had social drama, and we were committed to the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living. And we didn't want to do anything to harm the movement. Um, we were a group of believers. We believe in the way of peace, in the way of love. We believe in the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. We were, we were prepared uh, during the sit-ins and later during the freedom riots to die for what we believed right. in. I heard you say, you've written about that and you were prepared to die. How does one tell themselves, I'm prepared to die? You're a young man, you have your life ahead of you. How do you get that into your soul, into your being? I'm prepared to die for this. During the, the sit-ins and later during the Freedom Ride, as a group of students, uh, we signed wills. Uh, we knew it would, in some places uh, it could mean death, it could mean the end of life. But the cause was so precious. It was so necessary. Uh, we had this philosophy of building what we call the beloved community, or to redeem in the soul of America. So there was this whole idea, if it take a, some of our blood, to help save America, to help make our country and the world community better, we were prepared. You know, you, the other thing that strikes me is how strategic you all were and smart you all were about the impact. You made sure that you dressed well. Why was it important to be dressed really well? Well, well growing, growing up, um, we, when you would go someplace, you wanted to look what many young people back then called fresh, mm. clean, a shop. And we had been told during the sit-ins that if we continue to sit in, we would be arrested, that we would be taken to jail. And 
I wanted to have a, a, a new suit, but I had very little money. So I went to a used men's store and, and bought a suit. And a vest came with it. I needed some work on, on the suit, the, the pants, the coat. And I had it done. And when I was arrested the first time, on February the 27th, 1960, 89 of us were arrested. I felt free. I felt like I crossed over. And I did look clean. I did look like I was dressed up. Why was, what was that message of that you're trying to send to the larger world who saw you dressed well? Were you, were you just trying to do the juxtaposition to the other side? What was the message that you're trying to say? It was a message of saying to the other side that we were well dressed, that we were clean, that we did look fresh, and we just wanted to come together black and white college students and have something to eat at a little lunch counter mm -hmm. or in a restaurant. We didn't want to disturb anyone. We wanted to bring people together. When you gave the speech in the marsh in Washington, you were, you were young, you were very young, and you were one of 10 people to give the speech among formidable human beings, Martin Luther King, A. Philip Randolph, Walter Ruther, the head of the AFL-CIO. And there was at one point that people looked at your speech and they thought it was too radical or too, uh, you know, too radical perhaps is the right word. And you decided not to change a word. What was important about keeping your words, that speech, intact? The speech that I had prepared to give was a sense of the feeling of the young people in the movement, the feeling of the young people that made up the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It came also from the struggle of people in the Black Belt of Alabama or the Delta of Mississippi, or Southwest Georgia. I had been reading about what was happening in parts of Africa, where there was a group of black women marching, and they had been saying things like, one person, one vote, one man, one vote. So in the March on Washington speech, I said something like, I prepared to say, one man, one vote is the African cry. It uh, is ours too. It must be ours. Mm. And I had to give the speech. And when I was introduced by A. Phil Randolph, he said, and I present to you young John Lewis, the national chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I said to myself, this is it. I went straight to the podium, looked to my right, I saw a group of young people. I looked straight ahead, I saw this unbelievable mass of humanity. Then I looked to my left, I saw a group of young men, black and white, up in the trees, trying to get a better view of the crowd. And I said, this is it again, to myself, and I went for it. But on, the, on that day, Listen to Martin Luther King Jr. He turned the steps of the Lincoln Memorial into a modern day poor pit. He preached and he knew he was preaching. It was very inspiring, very uplifting. And President Kennedy invited us down to the White House. He welcomed us. And he was against the march. He was against the march. He, he has said to each one of us, when we first met with him, he said there would be violence and chaos and disorder and we would never get a civil rights bill through the Congress. But the day of the march, when it was all over, mm. and we went down and met with him, he was smiling like a proud father. Mm. He kept saying to each one of us, you did a good job, you did a good job. And when he got to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, and you had a dream. That was my last time seeing the president. Yeah. I'm my President Kennedy. 
Did you recognize or know or feel the significance of that event? Did you know how extraordinary that would be after the event took place? I, I sense that it was one of these unreal moments in the history of America. Mm -hmm when people from all over America, and there were people who had been living abroad, coming home to participate in that effort. It's uh, the music, the spoken word, it just, it's created this sense of we all in this thing together. And not anything we're gonna turn us back or turn us around. Take us to Selma on March 7th, 1965, 600 civil rights marchers heading out east of the city on Route 80. You reach the bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. You reach an army of state local police. What unfolded? We arrived on the bridge. We were walking in orderly, in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion. I was leading that march with a young man by the name of Jose William mm. from Dr. King's organization. Right. And the major of the Alabama State Troopers spoke up and said, and Major John Cloud of the Alabama State Troopers, this is an unlawful march, will not be allowed to continue. I give you three minutes to disperse, and return to your homes or to your church. And Jose Williams said, Major, give us a moment to kneel and pray. Again, he said, troopers, advance. I said, Major, may I have a word? He said, there will be no word. He saw the troopers putting on their gas masks. They came toward us, beating us with nightsticks and tramping us with horses, releasing the tear gas. I was the first person to be hit. I remember being knocked down, my legs went from under me, and was hit in the head all these many years later. I do recall being taken back to the church that we had left from. I, I thought I was going to die. Mm. I had a concussion. I thought I saw death. But I do recall someone at the church asking me to say something. The church was full to capacity. Hundreds and hundreds of people on outside trying to get in. And I stood up and said something like, I don't understand it. How President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam and cannot send troops to Selma, Alabama to protect us, who only desires to register to vote. And the next thing I knew I had been carried away to a little hospital, the Good Samaritan Hospital, operated by a group of nuns that took care of us that Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, and early that Monday morning, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Reverend Ratha Abernathy came by to visit us. And Dr. King said to me, John, don't worry. Said, you'll be okay. I've asked religious leaders, ministers, priests, rabbis, and nuns to come to Selma. And on that following Tuesday, more than a thousand ministers and priests and rabbis and nuns came to Selma and marched to the point across the bridge where we had been beaten on that Sunday. I did not march that day. I got out of the hospital that day. What was the impact of that in changing? America saw that. America saw the violence. America saw innocent marchers being savagely beaten. What was the impact of that in America at that particular point? That march, that march, the attempt to march from Selma to Montgomery had a, a profound impact on the psyche of America. There were individuals apparently watching television and they couldn't take it. They couldn't see it. Um, some of the networks interrupted their programming and went straight to Alabama, straight to Selma. And people started coming from all over the nation 
coming to Selma in support. People couldn't believe it at the heart of the Deep South, in America, that people were being beaten and trampled by horses and tear gas for trying to register to vote. The people were asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar of soap, the number of jelly beans on a jar, and it changed America forever. That was one senator from the state of Texas who took to the Senate floor first part of the week and said, shame on you, George Wallace, shame on you. Um, it changed America forever. You know, you went back to Troy and got a library card and they celebrated you many years later when you were first, as a child, you were told you couldn't come into the library. And it was basically an apology. And I'm wondering, are apologies important? Are apologies significant to receive them, to hear them, to get them? An apology is significant. It uh, is, have a cleansing effect, a cleansing impact. On the Freedom Rides in May of 1961, when I was 21 years old, I was beaten and left bloody with my uh, white seatmate at the Greyhound bus station in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Many years later, even after I'd been elected to Congress, one member of the Klan came to my office in Washington and he said, Mr. Lewis, I'm one of the people that beat you in Rock Hill, South Carolina at the Greyhound bus station. Will you forgive me? He was in his 70s. His son came with him in his 40s. Wow. They both started crying. They hugged me. I hugged them back. We cried together. Did you feel a sense of forgiveness there? Did oh, you yes. Feel oh, oh, yes. And our witnesses all across the it's, it's It's changing. Right. It, it gives you this sense of that we're in this thing together. Do you worry that the story that you've just told, the story of the civil rights movement, is going to be lost and that generations won't really know this was America? Do you worry about that? I'm concerned that generation that are growing up probably would never hear some of these stories, um, probably just never knew of what happened and how it happened. But I try to tell the story and encourage other people to tell the stories of what happened. I see members of the Little Rock Nine a visit with uh, a sister, one of the Fuller girls that were killed in the bombing of the 16th Street Church in, in Birmingham. Um, but it's important to keep the story alive. There was a police chief in, 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 in Montgomery. I was looking at his picture just a few days ago who literally took off his badge. At the First Baptist Church, he came to greet us. Same church where I first met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Ralph Abernathy. There's a young police chief. He said, Mr. Lewis, when you came here many years ago, our police department was not kind to you. The city of Montgomery was not kind to you. But he said, because of what you did, we have a better police department today. He said, they must know what happened in Selma, what happened in Birmingham, what happened here in Montgomery. Then he went on to say, I'm gonna take off my badge and present it to you. I said, Chief, you can't do that. You're the chief of police. You need your badge. He started crying, I cried, and the whole audience, including members of the press, and several members of Congress, we all cried together. What does it mean today to keep your eye on the prize? I, I, I say it all the time. I, I say it to my colleagues in the Congress. I said, whatever you do, never give up, never give in, never lose this sense of hope that we all can make our country a better place for all of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, sir.